This movie was uh, this movie was made during the haze of the '80s. Um, not my brightest moment in history. Um, this was kind of as the the bulb was dimming, if you will, for a while, and then then my gosh, it sparked back up again. But Corey Haim and I, who uh, I know loosely, uh, him and I did a a film together uh, in the late '80s called The Lost Boys, uh, and that film was quite haphazard in our meeting. Um, basically what happened was uh, I had been talked to about doing this film, The Lost Voice, from, from Richard Donner, and Richard Donner brought me in to meet with Joel Schumacher. Joel Schumacher and I hit it off pretty well. He liked my, uh, my acting skills and uh, asked me to go and do my homework and try and brush up on a character that was kind of like Rambo-esque, you know. So I, I created this character for Lost Boys. And once I got the part, they told me that this uh, this other kid named Corey was also going to be in the movie. And I had been hearing rumors about this kid floating around Hollywood. Um, as a matter of fact, we were both up for Lucas and we were both up for Goonies. Uh, he was up for my part in Goonies and I was up for his part in Lucas. So uh, it was a fair game by this point. You know, it was 0-0, zero, zero, uh, home team wins. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we met on the set, or I'm sorry, not on the set. We met, uh, one day he called up my answering machine and uh, said, hey, dude, this is Corey. Hey, man, we're, uh, you know, we're going to be hanging out together and uh, we're going to be doing this movie called Lost Boys, man, so we should, like, get together and chill, you know? So I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so we got together uh, actually with our dads and we went down to Venice Beach and we played a little football once the film was over uh, we of course had to do many public appearances and things like that together and suddenly this fad started if you will the Corys you know um, and we were kind of you know both a little skeptical of that whole thing because it was like who are these Cory guys anyway that everybody keeps talking about and what's so cool about them um, besides that we were pretty much like you know we, we wanted to stay individuals we wanted to do our own things and we didn't want you know our lifelong careers to be summarized by a lump of you know these two guys uh, a la carte so anyway we uh, you know basically decided that we weren't going to work together again. It was a nice experience, you know, enjoy your paycheck, I'll see you later kind of thing. And I had been auditioning for License to Drive. Um, I really thought the script was very funny. Natalie! Hey, Natalie! Uh... It, was, uh, it, was, it was just very broad. There was a lot... A lot in the script when I first read it, and I remember thinking, boy, that part of Les, that would be perfect for me right now. That's the, uh, the obvious next move in my career, <clears throat> to do a film where I really carry the film as opposed to, you know, having it rest on some other guy's shoulders, you know. Um, so I, I auditioned rigorously for the part of Les and uh, got a call from my agent one day, and they said, well, we have good news and bad news. I said, what's the bad news? They said, well, the bad news is, uh, well, you're not going to get the part of less in License to Drive. And I said, well, then fuck them. You know, just forget them all. I'm getting out of the business. They said, but the good news is that you did get the film. They just want you to play the second fiddle guy again to uh, <clears throat> Corey Haim. And I was like, you know what? This is blasphemy. This is this is an outrage, uh, cursed producers. And I was just furious about it. But I accepted the gig anyway, because that's what actors do. Um, anyway, so it ended up that here we were once again in the boat, working together and uh, being the two quarries once again. Um, and it really was, you know, as much as I'm making light of it all, I mean, it really was kind of that haphazard. It just... We didn't really know. I knew that he was auditioning for the film, and he knew that I was auditioning for the film, but, you know, he was kind of always told that I was auditioning for the other part, and I was always told he was auditioning for the other part, and it would never be a conflict. And it certainly wasn't a conflict when we ended up working on the film together. We were shooting at a high school, um, and as we were shooting at this high school, the, sh the school was actually still in session. So they would be kind of standing purged at the gates watching us, you know, screaming as we would walk back and forth from the set to our trailers. 
And uh, I remember this one day in particular when the school bells let out and our trailers were parked right there in front of the school. And we had to have security, you know, walk us from the set over to where the trailers were so we could, you know, we were, I think we were taking school together or something in one of the trailers. And the fans uh, basically surrounded, they, it was like the floodgates open, and these fans just surrounded the trailers. And they were sitting there rocking the trailers, you know, screaming and shouting, and everybody holding up pictures from their teen magazines and, you know, just trying to get a piece of us, you know. I mean, it was it was insane, probably 1,500 kids surrounding the trailer, and, you know, we're stuck in there. And when you're on a set, I mean, generally, like in those days, it, it, they didn't really have a lot of security on the set, maybe like one old guy who watched the trailers at night or something, but they certainly weren't, you know, ready for anything like this. And um, it was just, it was nuts. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. <laughs> this kind of Beatlemania thing going on with Corey and I, which just had started, and we didn't really notice it starting, but it had, and then it kind of went for the next, you know, seven years or something with the two of us as the Corys, you know. But that was kind of the first dose of superstardom of like, wow, okay, we gotta deal with this now. Um, but it was great at the same time. I mean, we had, a, we had a, an awesome time. Uh, those were the best memories, you know, the stuff where we got to, to see the fans and be there with the people and they were kind of right there in our face and watching the, the film being produced and things like that. Uh, the darker side of it all was, you know, just my own inconsistencies and, and being a teenager, you know, trying to, uh, to do a movie like this. I mean, teenage films are a lot harder than they look. <laughs> We're going to be locked up in a cell with men who have murdered and raped and robbed convenience stores. Will you take a pill or something? Will you just relax? Nothing's going to happen to us. We're juveniles. Nice call, Dean. This was, this was a weird period because it was when I was, you know, I was rough and rowdy teenager. I was uh, hanging out a lot with Sam Kinison, who spent a lot of time on the set in my dressing room. Um you know, had a lot of crazy parties on the set and off the set. Um, Corey was, you know, in outer space during most of it. So it was it was kind of an interesting experience in and of itself for that regard. This Mercedes has a dead battery. Heather was always the consummate professional. Um, she was beautiful, she was gorgeous. Uh, she was very, very talented actress and uh, you know, it was kind of a thing between Corey and I of, you know, who's going to go out with her first. You know, even though she played his girlfriend in the movie, uh, I believe that I'm the only one that actually dated her. And it was just one date. It was one date. I took her to uh, an awards show, I think, towards the end of the filming. And I think it was like a, an American Music Awards or something along those lines. And uh, we had a great time together, but it was kind of one of those things where, you know, you go out on a date in the middle of filming and then you realize the next day, like, okay, now we got to go back to work and, like, look at each other as work people. And, you know, one of those kind of big lessons, like, not really best to date your coworkers, you know. So I learned that one at an early age. But, um, but she was great. And uh, I've seen her since. And, you know, we're, we're still friendly. And, and uh, she's, she's a very talented young lady. Let me take a picture of it. Forget it. Don't you think you should let me take a picture of it? Okay, Charles. Okay. All right. Say cheese. Michael Monteseri, who played Charles, he was, you know, very good, very easy, uh, and quick on his instincts. The thing about him is, you know, again, going back to Corey and I being so kind of half-cracked during the whole movie, um, it was kind of like we weren't... We, we just weren't taking it all very seriously at that point because it was kind of like, you know, this whole, you know, Corey mania thing was happening and we were just kind of stuck in the eye of the hurricane. And I think part of it for us was, you know, keep everything as light and, and humorous as possible on and off the set. So we never took anything seriously. We were constantly, you know, doing practical jokes on each other and everybody else, Greg Beeman. Um, and poor Michael, who's stuck in these scenes with us, you know, is very professional, taking it all very seriously, always had his stuff memorized and, you know, to the book. And, you know, and then we'd come in and blah, 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 and we'd change the whole scene. Ignore. Bye, Mom. Be careful. Hey, guys. Hey, hey, guys. Where you going? Poor Michael would have to try and catch up with us. And I remember one day he said to me, you know, 
I want you to know that um, I'm really excited that I got this role. And I just wanted you to know before it's over that the reason that I'm here is because I respect your work so much. And I remember feeling like this big because it was just like, gosh, you take it that seriously? Oh my God. That means I should have been taking it more seriously. You know, it was kind of one of those wake-up calls of like, wow, I guess everybody else really, you know, sees this as a job. It was really a, a very talented, wonderful cast. Carol Kane, of course, is genius. Richard Master, who's great in everything he does. Nina Shamasco, who's great. We were very lucky to have such a great cast to work with. And um, we were, you know, we were like the clowns, if you will. You know, we would come in with our, you know, red noses and our big shoes and kind of like da 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 You know, and everybody else is there like, okay, today's scene we've got to take seriously and we're going to, you know, and we're just like, okay, what's going on? When do we get a break? What's up? I apologize for everything, but that ride was definitely worth the price of admission. I mean, that makes up for a whole life of boredom. Looking back on those things, you know, you see yourself in the past as opposed to who you are today and you go you know i wish i could have been a little bit more dedicated to the the film itself or to the other actors or you know anything like that you know dean I can't help wondering it's never gonna get that good for me anderson the only difference between you and that greaseball is that he has a license and you don't <laughs> Greg was great. Greg would be like, well, okay, here's what we're going to do, guys. Uh, we're going to have the uh, the car park here. You guys are going to come out. You're going to do your lines of dialogue. You're going to stop. You're going to give each other a look, and then you're going to move into the restaurant. Oh, okay, great, Greg. Thanks. That sounds great. We get out, jump on top of the car, start beating each other up, roll off together, and then go into the restaurant. I mean, just, you know, nothing that he would suggest, and we'd just be like, yeah, no, no, this is funnier, though. No, it's good. Really, it is. Just go with us. It's good. And uh, there was, you know, I'm sure he, we had to drive him crazy. We had to drive him crazy. But, you know, through it all, he was a consummate professional. And he was very, I mean, just a very good, easygoing attitude. I don't think there's any way that that film could have been finished if he didn't have the laid-back, easygoing attitude that he had. Because there was so much of this kind of hyper-energy coming from us all the time that, uh, you know, we needed that kind of grounding you know, kind of like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever you guys say, sure, 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 you know. And uh, it was a nice, it was a nice blend. That thing in your wallet, that's no ordinary piece of paper. That is a driver's license. The speech, the big kind of spiritual speech that I give last where I say. And it's not only an automobile license, it is a license to live, a license to be free, to go, to go wherever, whenever, and with whomever you choose. Uh, people never expected me to come in knowing my lines or prepared or anything like that because I would really just make it up as I went along. And this was one of those where it was like, you know, Greg Beeman was emphatic and he was like, you know, you've got to have this memorized. You've got to do this one for me. I mean, it's a very important speech and it's the pinnacle of the movie and it really all comes down to this and, you know, you got to give this to me. And I was like, yeah, we'll see. Don't worry about it. You know, I'll be fine. <laughs> and I know they were just all dreading what was going to happen when I walked onto the set. And, uh, you know, of course, I actually took the time and memorized it word for word and made it perfect for him because uh, I knew that a lot was resting on that one. Uh, and so when I came in and I did it in, like, two takes or something, and Gray was just, like, thrilled. He was just jumping up and down, like, oh, my God, look how easy that was. Why can't we always work like this? You know, well, because we just don't. <laughs> the car thing where it slides into that perfect parking spot in front of the pizza place, which we were just talking about. Um, because I remember it being uh, one of those things where when Greg explained it to us, we thought, man, that's so ridiculous. I mean, what, you're going to make the car fly off the hill, do like five flips, and then land on its feet and then slide perfectly into a parking spot without any damage on it? That is just the most ludicrous, unheard of thing I've ever heard. You know, it's just, it, it would never work. And he's just kept going, trust me, trust me, trust me. It's a great stunt. It's got to work. It's going to be. And I remember how they did it is, you know, it was several cuts. You know, they did the flipping of the car first. Oh, let's stop the car. Uh-oh. Ah! And then they did one final flip of the car where it kind of came down like this way and then slid in. And the way they did it is they had a cable underneath the car 
which came up from the ground in the parking lot, and it actually like pulled the cable pulled the car perfectly into spot. And um, I remember watching it going. Well, okay, I get it. That's pretty cool. Let's see how it all cuts together. And I remember seeing the film and thinking, wow, that was great. And it's got a huge laugh right when that happened. So obviously, Greg knew what he was doing, and we should have just shut the fuck up. Would you like some champagne? It might help. No, thanks. I already had some tonight. When they first cut the film, we got a lot of complaints from Mad, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, who said that we were glamorizing uh, drunk driving by, you know, the fact that Les drinks and he drives around for the rest of the night. It's like, you got this kid drinking alcohol and then getting in a car and driving another kid around who he throws in the trunk and, you know, I mean, it was pretty uh, controversial. Hi, how you doing? So we went back and we did reshoots. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. <laughs> you call yourself a friend? Shortly after that, we got to see a, an early cut of it. And I know that I was just very impressed with Greg's work. Whoa! Vito, help! And very impressed with the comic timing of it all. Hi, Les. And thought, you know, for all the, uh, the bullshit we put everybody through on this film, it all turned out for the best because it really is a funny film. Not too bad for a kid without his license, huh? And when I look back on it now, it really is one of my uh, fond memories of my career. I mean, it was a... Uh, you know, it's a very funny film. It's a cute story. Uh, I think it's something that everybody can relate to. You mustn't fuck with the Department of Motor Vehicles, Mr. Anderson. Every kid can relate to it, certainly, because everybody's been there with that frustration trying to get your driver's license for the first time. Uh, as a matter of fact, Corey and I were both trying to obtain our driver's licenses during the making of the film. You have failed. You have failed. You have failed. You have failed. So it was kind of life imitating art and art imitating life. My dreams never get this good. My fantasies yeah. never get this good, man. And this is only the beginning. <laughs> we were kids in the middle of, you know, the thunderstorm and, and just, we were just having a great time. You know, I don't know. Les, to live in fear is not to live at all. License to drive. So many years ago, I think I was uh, 16, 16 and a half in there. Um, I got the picture just by phone call. They just called, and, and um, I think Corey Feldman already auditioned for Les Anderson, my part. And uh, I'm not sure if he got it. I'm not sure if they said, yeah, you know, you're the dude, but we have to just do our routine here and make our calls. And uh, I guess I, I got a phone call. My manager got a phone call, my agent, whoever, and they asked if I'd be interested in this role. And I remember my mom met with John Davis, the executive producer, and they went to the Beverly Hilton Hotel, whatever, wherever, and sat by the pool, talked, negotiated my deal, and it was over. An innocent girl, a harmless drive. What could possibly go wrong? What appealed to me about the movie was the, the script that's so many elements of comedy, black comedy. <laughs> it was just, it was a riot to read. You know, and then you're, you're done reading it and you're saying, how are they gonna do all this? I mean, yeah, it could be funny and I can ad lib and, you know, I do the best I can do, but there's too much. It's just too much. <laughs> it intrigued me too because it was a big budget movie. You know, it was 20th Century Fox, some great people in it John Davis, Andy Licht, and Jeff Mueller, you know, the three producers on it. and. You know, the cast, myself, Corey Feldman. Corey's a great guy. Uh, we've been friends. We have been friends since, uh, I think, I'm about 15. Maybe a little younger, 14 and a half, 15, something like that. He's a good partner to, to work with on set. He's got a good soul. He's got a great heart. When we were really, really working together, just him and I, him and I, him and I, him and I, back-to-back -back movies, 
you know, when the director or the first AD or wardrobe or hair, whoever would say, Corey, we would know which Corey they were saying if their backs were turned, and that got a little eerie. You know, it was Corey, and but yeah, what's up? You know, and he'd still be doing his thing. If he knew it was him, I'd be doing. So that's how together it was for us. We had a pretty newcomer introducing Heather Graham. She was cool. Let's go. She was, uh, I'm pretty sure it was her first movie. Do you want to dance? Gorgeous, drop dead very friendly human being. I mean, you know, we had uh, the kissing scene to do, and I actually, I had I caught mono somehow, and she didn't want to kiss me, and I understood it, you know? But, you know, we were under we were under the gun, we had to do what we had to do, so I, I go, Heather, I'm gonna go take my medicine, I'll be right back. So I went and came back, I have my medicine, we're dancing on the car, she's supposed to be drunk, and she leans kissing to me, and so we go at it. And uh, I don't know what happened, but we had to reshoot on 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 a stage. I just remember her getting, she was not happy about the mono situation, me having to kiss her, but I was like, listen, it's not my fault, you know? To kiss her was great. I mean, she's a good kisser, you know? But the other scenes we had, too, were a lot of fun, you know, the when she was in the trunk of the car. I don't think that this is such a good idea, okay? All the jokes that are going around. I got a Mercedes in the back of a caddy. Wow. Did you ever imagine in all your life that you would see a Mercedes fit inside the trunk of a Cadillac? Carol Kane was really cool. She always walked around with uh, a cigarette filter because she doesn't smoke anymore, so she needs something in her hand or whatever. She's absolutely brilliant. I mean, she's really, really brilliant. She's fun. Fun, fun. For your information, this is exactly what I ate when I was pregnant with all of you. You turned out okay. You know, you spend one minute with her, you know, 45 seconds in a minute, you're cracking up, you know? And she's got the cutest voice, you know, she's got the cutest look. And then if you pair Carol Kane up with Richard Masser, who played my father... You are damn lucky your mother didn't go into labor tonight. No, I am in labor! Damn lucky! What?! He's brilliant, too. I mean, and he's hilarious. So these two together, it was great. And I really liked Richard Master, too. I liked working with him. I and mean, he's a great guy. Everyone became good friends What's with everyone. Wrong with you? Something uh, uh, wrong. Come on, what could be wrong with Greg you? Greg Beeman, he was a first-time director. He walked into his office, and he was sitting there eating a Caesar salad with his hands, mixing it up with his hands. This was like a great story way back when. Um, and just was like, nice to meet you. And he's like, uh huh, I don't think so. And I'm like, what's up, man? And he was totally cool. And uh, once I met him, and he gave me like a 10 minute thing in his, uh, this is what we're doing. And I'm happy you're here. And I was like, well, I'm happy you're here because what you just explained to me, you know, it just took everything out of my mind of, well, I was thinking, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? How's this going to go down? What do we, and he, and that's why he's the captain of the team. Greg loved when I improv I'm a free man. He relied a lot on myself and uh, Corey Feldman for, you know, well, I'm up for any suggestions. What's going on? Hit me with it. What's your, just, what do you have for a suggestion? Because I'm, you know, uh, I'm curious. You guys have been doing this for a while and you're doing great. And I want you guys to be comfortable doing what I'm wanting you to do, but mix it up. Don't worry about the noise, man. My parents are vampires. So he allowed us to really like kind of blend with his blend and then it kind of all took its own thing together. The scene where I'm taking my dad's car, he's got the diapers. When I'm going around the car and I'm jumping up and down, that wasn't in the script. Like a lot of stuff wasn't in the script. Get out! He was very flexible, very friendly, very open and um, you know, he just had his vision of license to drive. Hey, do you ever wonder what kind of car some of these babes would lose their virginity in? You never cease to amaze me, Dino. Remember, there was a party scene, and this is where Heather's breaking up with her dude, and she says... And, Paolo, if you're wondering about Saturday night, I just remembered. I already have a date. With who? With him. That party in there... I mean, it was a real party, man. They set it up perfectly, and extras came early, and 
So when we were there, it was like, you know, a lot of, you know, quiet on the, quiet on the set. I mean, it was, you know, they made it very realistic. It was great. Buckle up, son. It's the real world out here. When we started filming, I didn't have my license. I really didn't have a license to drive when we started filming this thing. And then there was the uh, DMV scenes coming up where I had to drive. So I had to do my test, do my written, drive, whatever. And Slow down! I got my, uh, my permit. See you on the battlefield sometime, soldier. <laughs> so we go back to set, and they let me do everything, even the parallel parking. That was me. And I was like, I can't believe I just did that. That was great. Woman in labor! Woman in labor! We're at the hospital. She's in, and the big crane is above the car before it smashes it. I think something happened. I'm not sure, but I think something happened where it didn't work really the first time. You know, it wasn't fast enough, or it came straight down instead of flat on the car. But when it happened, man, it was like, wow, that was cool. To see, like, a huge caddy just get flat. Ah. Only thing I didn't enjoy about the movie, I had a bad habit of keeping my mouth open all the time. So I was like, Mom, so what are you doing, catching flies? I did. I was, I was like, consistently, you know. And uh, that was the one thing I just wished I wouldn't have done as much. You know, because every time I'm on camera, I'm either doing like a smile I used to have, which I've broken somehow, and you just keep my mouth open and catch flies looking like that. And I just, those are two things from me being picky on myself. Oh, I'm dead. I'm so dead. They're going to have to bury me twice. It's a fast paced, <laughs> smart script. Where's my caddy? Lusted it! Great cast. I had a little trouble with your car, too. When I look back at making this movie, it, it, it uh, was just a hell of a lot of good hard work and a hell of a lot of fun to do.